it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. In tonight's cases, we examine liminal spaces. Now, typically these consist of vacant indoor areas such as hallways and waiting rooms, but can also include outdoor settings and even computer-generated ones, so long as they convey the right kind of atmosphere. Now, all liminal spaces share a few core similarities. They're always devoid of people, detached from any meaningful context, and are meant to be passed through rather than lingered in. Now, doing the latter can incorporate a sense of nostalgia, as well as unease and limbo. Part of the draw of a liminal space is to do with the feeling of canopsia, which is defined as the eerie, forlorn atmosphere of a place that's usually bustling with people, but is now abandoned and quiet. And this is what fuels the feelings of anxiety and discomfort that liminal spaces often produce, they're familiar environments presented in a strange, anomalous way. And it is this which we explore this very evening. Case 1. The Defect Awaken Always more of a bodily demand than a desire of the brain or heart. All too many times I've dreamt of sleeping the rest of my existence away here, an eternal peace from the corroding waves and the incessant thinking. Dancing to the beat of my circadian rhythm, however, is the only option that has ever presented itself. I imagine that it was a cruel summer's morning, with an onslaught of heat tearing its way through the building, fighting mercilessly until it's forced to retreat from the threat of the night. Of course, I never do get to feel the reprieve of daylight. The soft sprinkle of sunlight cascading across my skin, jumping from my forearm to my head and neck, and leaving it sweet nectar is something that I've only ever been able to dream of. Morning is when I awake, and night is when I become weary, the only two constants that I've ever been able to rely on. As always, after a brief pause to orient myself from a slumber that seemed more akin to interdimensional travel than rest, I climbed to my feet and inspected my surroundings, surveying every minute detail for any level of change. Every morning I prayed that something would be different, that anything would be different, but always to no avail. It had long dawned on me that my prayers were unheard, but it had become more of a ritual rather than any plea for help, serving as a way to comfort myself in the face of the known unknown that I found myself in. As I began to trudge around, spending what seemed like hours mentally willing my legs to move, I finally managed to break out into a mere shuffle. I took a look at the same four walls that entombed me day after day. They always greeted me with the same intrinsic pattern etched into them, almost like a code begging me to be deciphered. It seemed more like a taunting than a begging, though, mocking my amnesia and daring me to delve into the murky depths of my memory. Looking out further into the corridor brought my eyes to meet the same ashen door, deriding me with its endless possibilities and tricking me into thinking that one day there might be a way out. Always the same corridor leading to the same doorway past the same four walls overlooking the same sea. I pounded on it for a few minutes, hoping to hear a cry out from the void, but was met only with the echoes of disappointment reverberating in my eardrums and telling me to... Stop. Of course, I gave up almost immediately. Like a compulsion demanding to be fulfilled, I caved. What was driving me to listen to what seemed like auditory hallucinations brought about by my isolation in this cave? Oh, I couldn't muster a guess. Decided not to think about it, for I'd be left with nothing but thinking shortly anyway. I allowed myself to go into autopilot and let my legs take me to my final destination the screen door at the end of my abode overlooking the waves. With each step that I descended, the more awake I felt, the fresh ocean air wafting on the waves and projecting its fleeting fragrance into my nostrils drew me into something of a trance. Just the smell alone seemed to fill me with life and a purpose for the day ahead. As I finally arrived at the screen door, which was always jammed open, acting almost as a gateway between worlds that was unsealable by any mortal force. The crashing of the waves brought me to a standstill. 
if not for the omniscient force driving me forward, I would have crumbled to my knees at the immense pressure of the sight before me. I stood firm and faced off against the dreary sky, which always seemed to look more pallid than blue, before casting my gaze downwards into the waves that lay before me. Every morning before I was taken by the waves, I tried to start with the things that I knew, the things that I was absolutely sure of, about myself as well as this place. My hope was that my memory could be jolted somehow, and that I could add something to my list. I knew that the ashen door was impenetrable, that was a certainty. I knew that the weather never changed here, there's no day or night cycle either. I knew that I could still feel emotions, and I seemed human enough. I knew that I didn't have normal bodily functions, though. I had no desire to eat or to satiate my thirst, yet sleep still befell me when I'd exerted too much mental energy. My list had not changed for as long as I could remember, except for one thing. The waves. My peering soon turned into a fixed stare, while my eyes became magnetized to the waves. My peripheral vision began to muddy as I drifted outside the physical plane and prepared myself for yet another day. The waves began to ripple and contort, before eventually swirling into a sort of maelstrom that wasn't quite corporeal. As the spiraling continued, I began to see another person, almost as if I was watching them through a TV screen. I started to ponder what kind of life I would see, what lessons I would learn, what entertainment would I be given. Every day I saw one new life almost in its entirety, the joyous moments, the heart-wrenching failures. Sometimes I even found it well, fun, watching each person's endeavours and trying to imagine how I would do it differently. Maybe I wouldn't pursue that goal, maybe I'd put my time into this hobby instead. It seemed almost neurotic to take the sum of one's life and to review it as if it were a movie, but this place never gave me another option. Even if I wanted to resist the pull of the moor, to try and live my days out in silent isolation, I don't think it would have let me. With everything around me so far and so vast and rich with possibilities that I was unable to achieve, I began to find comfort in the cycles of their lives. Their routines, all so similar. Sleep and eat and work and play and love and then die. With the first few lives that I ever watched, I'd imagine that they were my neighbours. The sweet elderly couple living on the floor below me, always baking something exotic so that I could almost smell it if I tried hard enough. The ruddy squat man living in his childhood flat at the back of the building with his equally ruddy dog. The pretty blonde woman living two doors down from me with two loud children who would squeal with laughter into the early hours of the morning. Just doors apart, lives existing that directly impacted mine. My fate moved by each action, however small. Then I watched those two loud children, who were now quiet adults, say goodbye to their mother. I mourned. I wept. I searched for some great cosmic power to undo the timeline to give them even one more hour with their blessed mother. Even the empty gesture of flowers was beyond my reach. It took a few viewings before I realized that there was no use in getting attached. I could do nothing more than to take what was imparted onto me, take it into my very being and hope that I could allow their memories to live on through myself. By now they were just frames in a long movie, Quick flashes of colour, kindling to fire and ash in a moment, the dying embers searing themselves into my retinas. People living and dying indiscriminately, short specks of nothing in a world that would forget them soon enough. I couldn't hide my envy, watching as they arrived in strong waves and departed in soft sea foam, coming and going whenever they chose. Their lives, their love for one another. What was once a strange question to me had now become a fading curiosity. Had I ever had that? Had I ever been held, ever been called child? Oh, so many times I had been tempted to rock on the edge of my perch and fall headfirst into the waves below me. I wondered if I'd land into their world, be able to touch their warm faces and hear their stories, or if I would just float atop the water until whatever force put me here decided to put me back to keep the order, to keep the schedule. Whether I was put here as some sort of cruel lesson, a lifetime of watching others to atone for my sinister deeds, or if there was some other deep purpose, it was all the same to me now. Punishment or purpose, I was driven only by the waves. 
They guided my every action, my every thought and feeling, and drove me to keep existing. If I questioned this purpose that I'd been given, then what would I have left? I found it better to act than to agonize, and I believe that the waves did too. Well, it became very apparent to me that I was not viewing a person, but a child. Well, this immediately grabbed my attention, as all the lives I'd viewed so far had not started until they were almost adults. I watched as this child entered the world and took its very first, albeit hurried, breaths. My brain was beginning to salivate at all the moments that lay ahead of me. A life all the way from birth. Ah, oh, there was so much that I could see and learn from this. Not mere moments after I had this thought, though, the vision had already ended. Amidst my bewilderment... The moor seemed to spit a torrent at me, causing me to recoil backwards through the screen door and fall to the floor in shelter. I wondered if this was maybe a game, a test to see my reaction if my daily routine was cut short. I questioned if this really was a punishment and if this was the ultimate proof. As I thought a little longer though, my mind began to sink deep into an abyss as I came to a much darker conclusion. Neonatal death. Based on what I knew about the lives I'd seen so far, it added up almost perfectly. I grimaced as my mind tried desperately to process what I'd just seen, my thoughts seemingly buffering in order to cope with the mental overload that had just been placed upon it, before spiralling rapidly. I retreated away from the waves as quickly as I could, stumbling multiple times as I attempted to find my footing and escape back through the screen door, back to my own world. I collapsed to the floor in exhaustion. In previous viewings, I'd been tired, especially with some of the longer lives. Yet this one life had sapped the energy of twenty. As I lay curled up into a ball, I thought about the parents. I thought about their solemn faces drowning in a sea of thought before being overcome with a waterfall of pain. I thought about them, and then I thought about the mother being watched by her two boys as she passed away. I thought about her life trickling away right before their eyes, and then the child's evaporating before their parents ever caught sight of them. Before I could even begin to sob, to regurgitate the emotions that had been stuffed inside of me, that same familiar voice imparted to me a singular, soft-spoken word. Sleep. When I finally came to, I must have already been dragged out to the waves again because I found myself already in the middle of another viewing. Perhaps I'd slept too long, and instead of spending time rousing me, the waves had decided to bring me here first so as to not waste any precious time. All my viewings felt surreal and unexplainable, as if I was staring into an infinite unknown. Yet yeah, this time it felt different. I was looking down, hovering above four seemingly identical walls, and I was staring at a man sleeping. A ghastly haze was permeating throughout the place, impeding my vision and disabling me from seeing beyond the confines of the room. This body looked cold, almost as if it were shivering. The man looked weak and frail, and the fact that he was curled up into a ball made me doubt that he would survive even another night. The man's body began to twitch suddenly, before writhing in visible pain, twisting and contorting while my eyes were still glued to him. It was a pathetic sight. I tried to feel sympathy for him, but couldn't even muster that. I felt disgusted. His body didn't even try to put up a fight against its demise, to try and cling on to every precious second that it could. His body continued to convulse for a few minutes before finally freezing, making it seem as if time had stopped in that very instant, before everything snapped to a solid blackness. I was confused as to why I was only seeing the very last moments of this man's life, but guessed that it was another lesson being taught to me. A brief life with so much untapped potential, so many questions unanswered, alongside a life seemingly wasted, drowning in self-pity. And it made me angry. Why should this man get so many years, yet that child didn't even get a chance? Before I could think any further, the blackness had faded, and I found myself overlooking the same sleeping body once more, still unable to break my gaze as the man started to twitch and convulse again, before the vision had faded to black for a second time. And by this point, I was utterly dumbfounded. I had no possible explanation for being shown this man's life a second time, but as I watched the same events replay several more times, I began to grasp the situation that I'd found myself in. The horrible realization began to dawn on me 
as I started to pay more attention to the four identical walls that the man was stuck in. I noticed the ashen door towering over him. I saw the patterns etched into the ceiling above, mocking him, mocking me. It was me. That frail, weak man. That disgusting waste of a life. I was seeing myself. I was stuck in a time loop of watching myself succumb to the darkness. It struck me again that I must have been in some kind of nightmare. But why? I mean, in all my time in this place, I'd never dreamt yet. Now I find myself in this hellscape, a premonition of myself. Was this actually how I would die? Even though my mind had become aware that it was inside a dream, I was unable to jolt myself awake, cursed to watch myself as I completed the loop time and time again. Awaken. Waking up was a mercy that I was not afforded for at least a few hundred loops. I almost cried when I heard those familiar words bring me back to reality. By the time I rose to my feet, I could feel the weight of the smog inside my head, slowing me down and delaying all of my actions. No matter how much I told myself to forget, to remember that it was just a dream, the authenticity that I felt within the chamber of my mind made it next to impossible to pretend that it didn't happen. What I saw that night was something that shook me deeply. That image of me, that same image, that infinite image of a familiar individual. Me, but not quite. Everything here felt orderly, and even though the nightmare was chaotic, it was a controlled chaos, meticulous in its heinousness. It had to serve a purpose, and it left my mind with an infinite number of questions. I wanted nothing more than to remain horizontal and to ponder my mental ordeal, but I was brought to my feet. I felt the shadow of the day looming over me, and as I made my way closer and closer to that haunting screen door, I grew angry. God, I had no memory of myself, and the image that I was met with left me furious. The only thing that had driven me to keep going were the lives that I was viewing. It made me feel as though I was special somehow. I felt as though I were above these people that I was watching, like I was given this cosmic task for a reason. In reality, though, the quivering husk that was right before me was just like any other that I'd seen in my viewings. Anyone could do what I'd been doing. I wasn't even needed. The waves could have picked my neighbor just as easily as me or someone down the street from me, and the result would not have changed. Why was I here? What was the point? Well, by this point, it was like dragging a child kicking and screaming to a birthday party that they were dreading. Why would I continue to look at these lives if it was all pointless anyway? As I thought more and more about it, I wondered what I would actually see when I finally got around to viewing my own life. If my life was the last one on the list, would I see myself inside these four walls, day after day doing nothing but watching other people live their lives while I waste away here? Or would I see a life far away from here? A different world where I could do good and have an impact on the world around me, until being cruelly plucked away to reside here. Well, the thought of watching myself watch others day after day, well, that thought made me queasy, seasick. All this time I comforted myself with this role. I made myself believe that I was immune to the tribulations of those that I watched, but I am doomed to become just another vision, just another viewing. I'd finally been brought to the precipice between worlds, between this world and my world. I sat myself down on my perch and steeled myself. I decided that this cycle would be broken. I'd do the bidding of the waves no longer. So I stood up firmly and tiptoed along the edge, doing my best to slow my breathing. I turned to look over my shoulder, to give one final look to my abode, one final goodbye. I closed my eyes and let go of my emotions. I felt myself become weightless, before beginning to drift, and finally coming to a crash. Splash! In my last moments, before succumbing to the weight of the waves and surrendering my opportunity at escape, I thought about my home. I wondered if there were some before me. I thought about if someone would take my place, if I had condemned another to my fate. My cowardice serving only to inflict suffering on another. I do not believe that I was a coward, though. I know that I was strong. 
to last for as long as I had, for however long that may have been. I weathered every storm, I swam through the sea of myself, and I refused to be taken until the very end. It's my own strength that had carried me so far, and it's through my own strength that I chose to relieve myself. Not every wave is the same. Some stretch tall and crash down with the power of the gods. Some stretch wide and carve themselves into the rocks, immovable as they seem. In the end, the waves will never cease, for they are eternal. I let the waves take me, as they'll take us all eventually. Case 2 Andrews Exchange Enterprises I blankly stared off into the distance at the newly hung sign on the wall, lost in my thoughts, thinking about an article I'd read over coffee this morning. It was about a woman who'd won the lottery and quit her job to build homes for the less fortunate in third world countries. I imagine what it must be like to have that type of freedom. The sound of a jackhammer rattled in an obscure part of our office building. I'd grown accustomed to the sound these last several months as they worked on some upgrades to our shipping warehouse. My phone buzzed me out of my daydream. Jessica, may I see you in my office? It was my boss, Mr. Hewley, on my phone. Sure thing, Mr. Hewley. I'll be right in. I sighed to myself. If there's one thing I hated, it was when my boss wanted to see me in his office because that was never a good sign. I grabbed a notepad, a pen, and took one large gulp of my now lukewarm coffee and made my way towards Mr. Hewley's office. To get there, you had to walk back towards our shipping warehouse. It was a bit of a hike all the way there, well, what could he want? As far as I knew, I had not done anything wrong to warrant a reprimand. I hadn't called off sick in over a year, nor had he made any mistakes worth mentioning, because I'd just had my annual review the week before, and even received a raise. I was nervous, though, because he never asked to see me unless something was wrong. The last time he called me into his office was the week I was hired, to tell me I'd made several mistakes that needed correction. That was five years ago now. When I got to his door, it was closed, so I knocked gently on it. Come in. His voice was stern. I walked in and quietly shut the door behind me. Jessica, please sit down. I sat down, my hands trembling slightly from my anxiety. There's an issue with these reports James dropped off. I was wondering if you could help me decipher them. He smiled and I became at ease. I took a deep breath and took the paper he handed to me. What exactly am I looking for, sir? The numbers in regards to recent shipments are all off. The products he mentioned aren't even something we would have ordered. He says most of the products were ordered from us from India. It makes no sense. We only get our tool parts from China. Two million dollar mistake. I could see the sweat on his brow beckoning to be wiped away. I studied the orders. Then I saw the mistake. How did Mr. Hewley miss it? Well, it appears as though the order was cancelled and a reorder was created two days later. It's redlined here. It was an honest mistake because the company you order from has a similar name to the company in India. Mr. Hewley looked at me as though he didn't believe it. So I pointed towards the bottom of the shipping receipt. Oh, shame, he said under his breath. I had to let go of James when we caught the error yesterday. I looked at Mr. Hewley in shock. Oh, I had no idea. I said, genuinely amazed, because James had been a model employee. He'd never made a single error in the five years I'd been with the company. I need you to walk this over to accounting so they can uh, correct the books. That's all for now. Thank you, Jessica. You've become a prime example of what this company needs. I smiled. Relieved. My anxiety was gone for the time being. However, I did feel terrible for my ex-co-worker, James. I thought about James and what a nice guy he was as I left Mr. Hewley's office. Oh, I'd miss his polite demeanor and corny jokes. I was in a bit of a daze after what I'd learned only moments before as I made my way to the accounting department. I walked down the long hallway and turned right. 
I was still looking at the report when I realised I'd hit a dead end. There was a door at the end, so I stopped in my tracks. I thought there was a door that led to the warehouse from this hallway. Well, I must have been mistaken. I turned around and walked back the way I'd come from, making my way around the corner. Only the way I'd come from was now a dead end as well. How did I make this mistake? I need to pay closer attention. I needed to get these updated corrections to accounting. I became even more nervous at the thought of Mr. Hewley reprimanding me if it wasn't done properly. Well, he often checked up on your work and what you were doing throughout the day, and he even had spies. I was afraid he was already on the phone with the accounting department to see if I'd taken over the reports explaining the mistake. Why hadn't the accounting department caught the error? Well, I was growing more concerned when I got to the end of the hallway, and once again, it was a wall. There was no exit, except to go back the way it came. The walls were clean and freshly painted white, except for black and white paintings of a woman standing by a window. I began to think maybe I'd only made a wrong turn once again, since the building had recently been under construction. I took a deep breath and walked back towards where I thought I'd come. I heard a group of men coming round the corner. I smiled and waved at them, trying to grab their attention. Excuse me, can you tell me how to get to the accounting department? Well, I think since the renovations in this building has caused me to lose my sense of direction, I made a wrong turn. Three men, all in suits, stopped and looked at me. They said nothing to me as if someone pressed the pause button on them. They watched me blankly, and then two more men walked up behind them. Can you tell me which way accounting is? Now I had five men all staring at me in suits. Perhaps they were foreign. We had visitors from other countries all the time. English? I was met with more blank stares. <laughs> I felt stupid as the thought occurred to me that, if they were visiting, they might not know where accounting was either. Then they turned to look at each other, and almost as if someone pressed play, they began walking towards me. And the strange men walked around me, all talking in unison, but I couldn't seem to make out a word they were saying. They continued past me, walking around the corner, when I heard a door slam shut. I followed in their direction but I couldn't find the door that they would have left from. Bewildered, I stood to look from right to left, up and down. I heard footsteps behind me, and I turned to see James. Oh, hello, Jessica. He smiled at me. Did Mr. Hewley hire you back? If so, I'm so glad. Hire me back, he chuckled. Uh, yes, the um, error on the shipping report. Oh, he looked at me, confused. I finally gave up. Oh, never mind. I'm trying to find my way to the accounting department. Ah, oh, that's easy peasy, he smiled. First door on your right at the end of the hallway. Well, I'd just come from that end of the hallway. James, this might sound like an odd request, but could you walk me towards the door? Uh, yeah, of course, Jessica, he grinned. He walked me towards that part of the hallway, and sure enough, there was a door. Over it was a sign that said, Accounting. Relieved, I thanked him and went in. I was ecstatic. I'd finally gotten to my destination. When I walked into the accounting office, the head of accounting, Julia, greeted me with a smile. There was a rather large mess on the floor. Her computer was on the floor next to a very crooked desk. Above her was a large hole in the ceiling where a cement block had been dropped. It was a construction accident. Can you believe it? If I'd come through that door fifteen moments earlier, you would have walked in as this was happening, Julia said, clearly still shaking but grinning from ear to ear in shock. Oh, are you okay? I asked. Yeah, just so happens my daughter's school called me seconds before. I couldn't get reception, so I had to leave the room. Peanut allergy concern after she came in contact with a friend's sandwich. Oof, such a crazy Monday. I gave Julia the updated shipping order, and then left as a crew of construction workers were coming in to assess the damage. I made it back to my desk when Tessa, our receptionist, came up to me crying. Oh my god! 
tears were falling down her face. Tessa, my God, what happened? Oh, I just heard the most horrible news. James from shipping was found in his living room after he'd hung himself. They think it's because that mean old Mr. Hewley fired him. How? I'd seen him just moments ago. I checked a day later. There was an obituary stating he'd passed away. I'm grateful that I'm alive and not seriously injured from the construction accident. I don't fully understand what happened that day in the hallway, or if it was a glitch. One thing's for sure. I'm still afraid to go down that hallway, and haven't since. Case 3 So, my boss is a dick. He called me up on the phone and told me he uh, needed someone to check on the office space. And that someone was me because I live closest and I'm also the key holder if the alarm goes off. Well, I told him if he thought we'd had a break in he should call the police and he said... Oh, you can't have Blob comping about all over the place. Not with all the uh, sensitive material the office deals with. You know, just to be clear, we deal in personal finance, not state secrets. So sensitive material in this case meant something not kosher is at the office. No, Dominic, that was likely to be something in his desk. Well, I told him we have the shelter-in-place rules and it's essential trips only. But is he having any of that? Of course not. Like I said, he's a dick. Apparently it's essential that I go to the office. Never mind the fact we have a damn quarantine at the moment, or that me being stopped and questioned getting there is a real possibility. I don't even know what he expected me to do at the office. I'm not some secret ninja-skilled office worker able to take intruders down with a few flying kicks, nor am I qualified to check the in-house server for problems. Well, he did say that my not doing this might result in him thinking about my position in the company when this is all over. So, not just a dick, but a blackmailing dick. Well, I said I'd go, but I wasn't bringing drugs out so I could get pinched for carrying. And he said that was fine. It wasn't about the drugs. Damn, I knew it. I knew he had that stuff in his desk. It was about the fact that he was getting some odd video on his feed from the office cameras. Which meant someone was probably on site and doing God knows what. He hadn't seen people per se, but shadows and movement on the footage. And we did have some expensive equipment, so I guess I could understand his insistence. But I still wasn't happy that I had to go and check it out, because his stash meant he wasn't about to call the cops. Well, it took me about ten minutes to get down there. It was odd walking almost alone in the normally busy street. Very few cars and buses, too. It would have been creepy if it hadn't been daylight hours. Our office was on the high street, above what started out as a travel agent's was now an upmarket handbag shop. At the side of the storefront was an ordinary front door, which opened to a long, steep staircase, currently dark. We had the two stories above the shop. The main floor was our offices, mostly open plan, and above that, Dominic's office and the on-site server room. I opened the door, keyed in the alarm code to turn it off, noting that it was still showing secure, and turned on the light. In and out was the plan. Check if there's a burglar or damage. Check the fire escape, any locked boxes, and so on. Of course, if there was a burglar, I was noping out and calling the police myself. Screw Dominic and his shady desk contents. Up the stairs to the first floor. So far, nothing hinky. No more stranger tiptoeing around the edge of the door, or indeed any sign of disturbance that I could see. No papers on the floor, no drawers opened, all the PCs and laptops still on the desks, none missing that I could see. One of the overheads was flickering annoyingly though, not new, it had been doing that since before the lockdown, but now in the relative silence, it was slightly disquieting. So I went around checking corners, opening storage cabinets, now feeling slightly foolish. No doubt Dominic was watching all this through the CCTV and laughing at me. The office monkey, skulking around inspecting everything like a good little soldier. I sighed. Thought about flipping the bird at the camera. Decided against it. I went upstairs to Dom's big suite. 
There'd been no odd noises so far, no shadows or shapes that he'd said he'd seen on the security feed. I was starting to get fed up with this. I deliberately banged open his office door and started loudly opening and closing things I didn't need to open. That is, unless a five-year-old child burglar was suspected of breaking in and hiding in a liquor cabinet. And then, the desk phone rang. I groaned inwardly. This was my own fault for being annoyed and showing it. Now Dominic was calling to rip me a new one. I rested one hand on my forehead, rubbed it, and picked up the phone. Hello? At the third stroke, the time will be 6.30pm precisely. Beep, beep, beep. At the third stroke, the time... Oh, I hung up. Hmm. Didn't you have to call the speaking clock directly in order to use it? Did Dominic have it pre-programmed to call him back at a certain time of day? Every day? Was it even a thing to have it call you? I picked the phone handset up again and listened. Dial tone. <laughs> okay, so that was weird. Oh, maybe Dominic had had it called from his house and had it forwarded to the office to mess with me. Yeah, that sounded about right found myself getting annoyed all over again. And then, the desk phone rang. I picked it up slowly. This time it was, Dominic. Tim, what the hell are you doing? I waved at the camera. How long does it take to search the office? I frowned at the handset. Dom, there's no one here, mate. Uh, I'm ready to leave. Wait. What do you mean, how long does it take? You wanted me to look on both floors, right? I just got to your office like five minutes ago. Look, downstairs is fine. Nothing missing. Tim, you were down on the main floor for like two hours just staring into space. Oh, do I need to drug test you when you get back to work? Then he barked out a laugh. Oh, better stay out of my top drawer. Seems like you can't handle it. I could hear the amusement in his voice. <laughs> well, I'm heading out now anyway. Going off for the weekend to the in-laws now this is sorted. I had no idea what he was talking about. Two hours? I mean, I'd been here all of 30 minutes, maybe 40. I'd arrived at 4pm. I used my fingers to make a gap in the blinds on the big window. Hmm. It was dark outside. Not full-on nighttime dark, but... For sure the sun's just going down, Dark. This didn't make any sense. I've been here for 40 minutes. Yeah, sorry, Dom. Uh, I guess I let time get away from me. I'm going to go lock up again and leave. Yeah, have a great weekend. I hung up and ran downstairs to the main office. The door to the photocopier room was slightly open. I knew I'd closed it. I closed all the doors to the peripheral rooms as I'd gone along. Maybe it just hadn't caught and I hadn't noticed it. I opened it more fully to peek inside. Nothing. Well, a photocopier and paper and a shelf full of stationery, but nothing else. I closed the door and made sure the latch bolt had engaged to keep the door shut. And then, the wall phone rang. I sighed. Oh, Dom. I'd already told him I was leaving. I picked up the handset. At the third stroke, the time will be 9.14pm and 10 seconds. I slammed the phone down. What the actual hell was going on? I knew I hadn't caught the speaking clock myself, and now I was pretty sure Dom wasn't doing it either. My mind suddenly went to the time it was quoting me. 9 p.m.? How? I ran over to the window on the main floor and yanked up the blind forcefully. It was pitch black outside. The moon was out. The street was quiet, empty. No traffic now. All right. There was something seriously wrong with me if I was losing time like this. Maybe I was sick. I wasn't spending another minute in this damn place went to the end of the office to go down the stairs and leave, and I ran. The stairs weren't there. 
the office just went on. It looked like the same floor plan as the part I'd just walked through, but there was no exit door. I turned around. I mean, obviously I'd missed the door, got confused, taken a wrong turn. I slowly retraced my steps back to the photocopier room. The door was slightly open. I kicked it closed. Then I pushed hard against it, making sure it was properly shut. I leaned my back on the door, trying not to breathe too hard, irritated and confused, attempting to reorient myself. The copier room was here, which meant the stairs must be. I looked down the corridor. The door definitely wasn't where I remembered it being. I placed two fingers on my wrist, feeling my pulse race, trying to slow it down. God, I feel like I'm having a bloody stroke. It was supposed to be a light-hearted remark, self-deprecating, but my voice sounded really terribly loud in this stillness. The flickering overhead started to buzz intermittently. I looked up briefly and then sighed. Again, it sounded much too loud. What was I supposed to do? How could an entire staircase move? I moved away back into the main office trying to ignore the strip lights blinking and fizzing and went back into the break room. I sat down at the table and remembered my mobile phone was in my pocket. I pulled it out. It came on but said there was no signal. I shook it. <laughs> Don't ask me why I shook it, but I did. The zero bars didn't change at all. I tried to connect to the Wi-Fi, but it said there was no connection available. That was odd too. I mean, the office definitely had Wi-Fi because Dominic had put it in for his own convenience. I suppose it was possible he'd turn everything off due to the lockdown. There's no one would be here to use it. Hmm, that sounded like a reasonable explanation. Except, I still had an uneasy feeling. By now, I can't honestly tell you what I was thinking, or if I was still thinking rationally. I was hoping I was asleep and dreaming, and I'd wake up at any moment. Finally, I'd nodded off while checking the rooms, and this was just fantasy. Yes, I know that someone falling asleep in what still felt like the afternoon while casually walking around seemed unlikely, or about as unlikely as a set of stairs going missing, but what else could it be? As a test, I hit my arm against the tabletop, and then swore loudly. <laughs> that really hurt. I don't recall ever having a dream where pain seemed so real. I shook the cell phone again. Nothing. No bars. I opened the blinds in the break room. Looked outside. Still dark. Couldn't believe I'd been in here this long. I wasn't hungry or thirsty. But I picked a can of coke out of the fridge and drank some. Just to have something to do. I sat for a few moments, drumming my fingers on the table. I didn't want to talk out loud again or... Though I didn't want to admit it, hearing myself in the echoing quiet was starting to disturb me. I decided to call Dominic, except that he'd never let me forget this ever, and it would make him send someone else over. If he wasn't at home, I was going to call the police and have them come get me, and live with the shame that I was lost inside my own office. I went back outside, looking for the nearest landline copier room door was open slightly. I know I made some sort of noise, somewhere between a faint scream and a wail. God, this is ridiculous. I glared at the door and went back into the break room, grabbed a chair and dragged it outside. I jammed the back of the chair under the copier door handle. I could feel my temper rising as I did so. Right, there. I would store out this stupidity. Go on, open it now. I went to one of the desks in the open plan room and grabbed the phone. No, dial tone. I threw it at the wall. Another phone. Still, no dial tone. What the hell? I marched back towards the end of the corridor where the stairs should be and started banging on the wall. The wall sounded solid, like the rest of the walls. 
I had a thought that maybe Dom had played some evil prank on me by having someone put up a false wall over the stairs to make me crazy. But these walls all seemed like plaster-covered brick. None of them sounded hollow. I laughed, but I stopped suddenly as I didn't like the sound of it at all. There was an edge of hysteria to it. Well, my next idea was the window. We're only two stories up. I could jump. Even if I hurt myself a bit, I wasn't likely to kill myself at 25 or 30 feet up. Of course, I smacked my head with the heel of my hand. I was an idiot. The window was a great idea. The break room window had been painted shut from the looks of it, against the fire regulations, but well, there were other windows. I did try opening it, rattling it like a champion, but it wouldn't budge. Okay, there were other windows. I tried the one at the front office next. The one over the handbag shop awning. It should have opened. It didn't. I know it should have opened because I'd seen it open during the previous summer. The office didn't have AC. I mean, we're in South London, not South LA. Most offices in older buildings didn't have AC. But I tried the window again. Nothing. It wasn't painted shut. It was just not opening. I could feel a headache starting. I picked up one of the useless desk phones and threw it at the stubborn window. Bounced off. The stapler had no effect either. Didn't even chip the glass. This wasn't happening. I don't remember the next few minutes because I think I went a little bit crazy. I must have thrown everything at that window, including a stool and a small printer table. Nothing even made the smallest crack or chip in the glass. It wasn't even scratched. I trudged back towards the break room. The wall phone rang. I stared at it. It kept ringing. I picked up the handset. At the third stroke, the time will... I cut the call off before it could tell me. It was still dark outside. I didn't care what the damn time was, what time it was, what time it said it was. It was wrong. Or I was wrong. Everything about this day was wrong. I took a deep breath. Let it out, somewhat shakily, I'll admit, but it did calm me a little. As I headed back to the break room, I noticed the door to the copy room was slightly open. No. It came out as a whisper. The chair was gone. I dashed into the break room. The chair I'd taken from there to put under the door was still not there. I slumped into one of the remaining chairs and put my head on the table. I had lost a flight of stairs and a chair now. I wanted to laugh, but I didn't. I was going to ignore that door from now on. From the corner of my eye I saw... Hmm, something. A shadow. Maybe from the moonlight now shining in through the indestructible window. Oh, it was nothing... Just a tree branch shadow, I told myself. A tree branch shadow from the non-existent trees in the high street. I laid my head down on the table again. I think I slept for a few minutes. It could have been longer. I had no way of telling. I seemed to lose time again. Well, I wanted to go check the copier room door, but I didn't move. I'd left it open this time. It couldn't scare me now. I drank some of the coke, grabbed some chocolate out of the snack drawer in there too, wolfed it down. Something definitely passed by the outside door. It wasn't a branch shadow. It moved as if someone was walking past, but there was no accompanying sound. No footfalls. Footfalls, I said out loud and grinned. Foot. I drew in a breath. Falls. I started crying. The phone in the break room rang. I stopped my tears abruptly and wiped my eyes on my sleeve. Since when was there a phone in the break room? I'd been in and out of there for what was apparently hours, 
and there hadn't been a phone. <laughs> Why would there be? I looked around the room until I saw it. It was sitting on a chair. The chair that had been under the handle of the copier room door. The phone wasn't plugged in. It continued to ring. I don't give a shit what time it is, I said, glaring at it. It kept ringing. I bit my lip and picked it up. I answered it. What? I could hear breathing on the line. It sounded heavy, but not like someone panting. It was much more. In it sounded purposeful, intense. Hello? Who's there? I tried to keep the tremor out of my voice. More breathing. I need help. I'm stuck here. Well, at this point I threw caution to the wind. I needed out of this craziness. I just wanted to go home. The breathing intensified and seemed to become lower pitched. Please stop this. I, I want to leave. My own voice had sunk to a pleading whisper. I didn't care. Dial tone. One second of hope to call out, then dead line. Outside the break room I heard a door creak open. I knew immediately which door it was. I tried to ignore it, but it creaked again. I got up, now suddenly, shockingly furious, ran out to the copier room, grabbed that goddamn door and slammed it over and over and over again. I know I must have yelled because my throat was hoarse after I stopped taking out my frustrations and came back to my senses. I bent over, my hands on my thighs, trying to control myself, breathing as heavily as whoever or whatever had made that last phone call. I did wonder if I was just losing my mind, but the stairs leading to the outside door were still missing. I wasn't hallucinating that. They were just not there anymore. Oh, of course, if I had lost my mind, maybe they were there and I was just hallucinating them being missing. I took in a deep breath. My sanity seemed to be hanging by a thread, but I couldn't succumb to madness. I stood up, trying to form some coherent thoughts. I needed to get out. I needed to get out now, before whatever it was got worse, before I lost more time. I wondered if I should just explore the extra part of the office. The part that had replaced the exit door and just kept on going. <sighs> I'll be honest, I didn't really want to go walking into an area that could very well be part of my hallucination. If I had gone mental and the stairs were actually present, I'd just fall straight down them. On the other hand, I probably wouldn't die from tumbling down one, albeit steep, flight of stairs. And as a plus, I'd be out of the office at last. A plan with uh, a few drawbacks then, so why did I feel so uneasy about it all? What could be worse than just sitting here? I started moving forward, very slowly, still unsure about the situation. At the edge of my vision, something moved. A shadow, again. I turned, but there was nothing. I began to walk just to few steps at a time, and with my senses all on full alert, towards the new part of the floor. A slight creak behind me told me the door of the copier room had opened. I ignored it, gritting my teeth and wiping the tears that had welled up in my eyes. It didn't matter, it was just a crap door. It could stay open or creak or whatever it was going to do, and I was going to take no notice of it this time. None. I had to resist the urge to turn back and look at it. I clenched both of my fists at my sides. Not looking, not caring about the door. The copier room door that refused to stay shut. Nope, not going to think about it either. I moved forward a little more, a little further into the new office. A couple of hesitant steps. I stopped and listened intently. 
Nothing. No noises. No shadows. I looked up ahead. There was a big window at the end of the office. Bigger than the one I'd tried to smash open in the real part. What did this window even overlook? The building didn't go into this direction, and if it did, if it was possible, it would be hanging over the corner of the next street. I was suddenly really, really reluctant to get close enough to look out of it. I could feel myself starting to sweat, even though it wasn't hot. I felt slightly nauseous too. Come on, a couple more steps. A phone in the large faux office began to ring. I swallowed audibly. I wasn't going to speed up to get to it. I wasn't even sure I wanted to get to it at all. I could only see one phone in the big space, and it was very close to the large dark window. Not right under it, but dead center on a desk a little ways in front. A few more steps, still hesitant. The phone continued to ring, and it looked almost like it was glowing now. I don't think it was, I was just staring so hard at it that I'd lost all peripheral vision. Something outside the window moved from left to right. It was dark out, nighttime still, but whatever moved seemed just as dark, like dark water against dark sky. My eyes snapped up to track it. The phone stopped ringing. We were at least thirty foot off the ground here. What the heck could be moving outside that I could see? What? Nothing good, I thought to myself. Another step forward, closer to the window, to the desk, at the phone. Another liquid ripple across the blackness. I could hear my heart hammering against my ribs. It sounded so loud to me that I wasn't sure if it was actually audible. One more step. The phone started ringing once more. My breath was coming hard and fast now, and I felt dizzy. A creak far behind me. I didn't turn, but I did flinch. I couldn't help it. Rippling out the window. Faster now. Almost closer. The ringing sounded louder. Oh, I wanted to scream and run and set fire to the entire office. Fire. Fire! The fire escape! It was as if light had gone off in my head. The fire escape. I hadn't checked it as I'd planned. It couldn't be locked as it only opened from the push bar on the inside. The fire escape. I turned around sharply as I heard breaking glass, and then a swishing noise, and on the back of my neck, breathing hot and intense and wet. My nerve broke. Yelling, I ran full tilt, down past the open copier door, past the break room, down the hallway, up some stairs to the mezzanine where the fire door, the fire escape door, stood closed. I hit the bar at speed, pressing down on it with all my weight, and it shot open into the chilly night. The metal stairs were gone, though. I barely noticed it as I flew past, still picking up speed. I sailed through it, out and down into the darkness. Oh, I landed hard, really hard. It seemed that I fell a lot further than thirty feet. Something broke inside me as I smashed into the dirt, and then I passed out and knew no more. I woke up here. In hospital. My legs broken and I have crushed ribs. I tried telling them what happened, but inspecting the building, the police found no absence of stairs or any evidence to support what I'd said. And I've been referred for mental health assistance. Well, I've quit my job, obviously. There's no way I'm ever going back to that office. Oh, I have to go now. The phone in my room is ringing. Case 4 Final Penance I should look before crossing the road. I didn't know, so there's that. 
Oh, I'd done it so many times, but today I was in a hurry. I had a date or a meeting or something. Oh, it's funny, I remember urgency and a feeling like this was a big and definitive moment in my life. Now that I'm dead, the specifics seem to just float away. All I know for sure is that I wanted to get somewhere quick, so I rushed down the stairs of my apartment right into the road. I remember the van colliding with my right side and the feeling of being thrown into the air as my bones cracked and contorted. And then I was somewhere else. It smelled like old books and horse shit and rain. It smelled like half-melted memories. It was dark too, but not like you think of dark. Almost sort of grey in a way I can't put words to. The floor was hard and dull looking. The ceiling was much the same, save for white spaces, letting in light more powerful than any shadow. No one had to tell me I was dead. I done fucked up. There were chairs lining the wall in front of me. They were empty, well, except they weren't. When I tilted my head, I could see the shapes of beings made of fire, or wriggling snakes, or darkness itself. They sat in those chairs as much as they could be said to sit. They watched me with cold and infinite eyes. And there was a doorway smack dab in the middle of the wall. It felt like a black hole ought to feel. It was a bitter and sucking nightmare thing. And I knew without being told that there was something hungry behind it. The angels watched me from their seats. And they produced a noise like a nuclear bomb or television static. It was a question that demanded a complete and irreversible answer. I flashed back to being a child in Catholic school. When it came time to confess my sins, there was no room for refusal. I get so nervous waiting in the pews, I used to laugh, and some permanently frowning teacher would stare daggers into my skull. When it was my turn, I'd march right up to the old priest in his little room, Tell him of my masturbatory habits, or stolen candy, or cheating on a test, or whatever it was. I'd cry. Sometimes I'd shit myself a little bit out of fear of hell. I'd leave feeling sick but relieved to have passed on my shame to a frail little man in God's employ. Now my sins came pouring out like vomit after a night of shitty cocktails. I told them about the time I hit my mother as a child. I told them about the time I said a slur when drunk. I told them of all the nasty, unforgivable things, and they laughed and laughed and laughed like the demons which were their cousins. The angels saw me as the pointless and pathetic thing I was. Well, it was unbelievably freeing not to matter. Oh, one by one the heavenly beings departed. They just faded away like images on decaying film. Now I'm alone in a room which reminds me of every half-remembered dream I ever had, but it's somehow so unremarkable it's painful. Well, this must be purgatory. This must be where they cook away the sin and wipe off the shit of life from the asshole of your soul. At least that's what the Catholic part of me thinks. Other parts of me are just freaked the fuck out. Maybe I'm still dying sprawled out on the pavement. God is coming. At least that's what I'm calling it. God, I can hear it. It sounds like rushing water. It's in the doorway now. Oh, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. Case 5 The Room The woman sat in the chilly upstairs room of her two-story house, where she kept her computer. She stared at its blank screen, waiting for some sort of inspiration to hit. It usually came in sporadic bursts of typing, with long intervals of blank staring. She merely sat and waited for it to come. Of course, it always did come, though sometimes it took a long time and sometimes it didn't. Sometimes she feared it never would, and she would just sit in front of the screen, staring at it, and waiting for while life slipped by unnoticed. Other times she feared something else might come instead, like the hand that she kept feeling lightly touch her shoulder, or the face in the mirror, or worse still, the figure emerging from behind her. 
But that was all in her head, of course. At least, that was what everyone kept telling her. But lately, she started to wonder if that was true. She hated the upstairs computer room, as they called it. It was a small room with a little addition on the back of it. Her stepfather had put it on, and then nailed a thick jean quilt between the two rooms. He had done this because the addition had never been finished, and there was no insulation on the walls. It got so cold that she often became afraid that she would simply freeze solid in her chair, fingers poised above the keyboard, ready but never moving. The computer room was originally a bedroom. <laughs> okay, it was still a bedroom, but now it was an extra bedroom slash computer room. It contained a desk with a computer on it, an open closet, a window, a bed, and, of course, the addition. The blanket wasn't so bad. It was the mirror next to the screen that frightened her late at night, when her parents lay nestled in bed and the house was deathly silent. She would sit there waiting for inspiration to hit her, and her eyes would drift to the right of the screen and settle on the reflection of that blanket hanging in the doorway. Then she would stare at it until she would see a bone thin hand curl its withered black fingers around the edge of the blanket and she would jerk her eyes back to the screen and shiver. After that she began turning music on as she typed. It helped, if only a little. She'd always had a hard time with horror flicks. She loved watching them, but she hated it too. It was hard to explain. She did like to watch them, but there were always the nightmares afterwards. She would lie in the dark when it was over and shudder with fear. It was always a little better if she was at home because well, then she could cuddle up close to her little dog. Feeling his comforting warm body next to her always dispelled some of the mind-numbing fear. It seemed to bring her somewhat back to reality. But when she was at her sister's house, or staying the night at one of her four aunt's houses, it was a lot different. She would often be alone in one of the extra bedrooms or on the couch, in the seething darkness. Her sister loved to watch scary movies with her, and then afterwards she would lie awake on the couch underneath the big window, wishing to God that sleep would come soon. Of course, this didn't help at all, with the growing fear of the mirror and the blanket in the computer room. She would imagine all sorts of horror movie monsters lurking behind it, waiting for her to turn her back to them so they could drag her back there. In the light of day, she would tell herself she was being silly and to quit imagining things. But come dark, she always typed quickly. She would often ask herself why, if she was so afraid of that room, did she insist on using it? The obvious reason was that her computer was in it. There were two computers owned by her family. The downstairs computer, which was everybody's to use, and her computer, that she'd bought with her own money. It would have been easy to move to a new room in the house, but the only other place it would fit in was in the back room downstairs, but that was where the family computer was set up. She might even have put it in her own room, but her PlayStation was in there, and there was no room or a plug for both, and so she was stuck with it in the extra bedroom. She could also type in the morning instead of at night, and that was really the only time of day she wasn't busy, and she couldn't just give up on typing. It was her passion. She loved it more than anything else, and besides, she felt strangely compelled to the room and repulsed by it at the same time. She felt the need to go into it at night, even though her mind screamed at her to just leave it alone. It wasn't just constantly seeing the mirror out of the corner of her eye that concerned her. It was all the little things in the room that added up to her growing alarm. It gave her chills just thinking about it first thing that happened was when her nephew slept in it one night. 
This was before her computer had been put in there. He told her it happened just before he fell asleep. You know, right before you drop off into dreamland. He said he felt a slight pressure on his right shoulder. Like someone had lightly put a hand on it. He was instantly awake. But no one was there. He never slept in that room again. He used the futon in her mum's craft room instead. The second thing to happen was the chair. She put one of those big backed roller chairs in the room for her computer and then she started to notice that no matter where the chair was facing when she left the room, it was always facing the window which was directly across from the door when she walked back in. After that, things began to fall into place a little quicker. She began to hear funny noises, like whispers. She started seeing things out of the corner of her eye. And most recently, she started seeing that bone-thin hand curling around the edge of the blanket. Of course, the hand was never there when she turned around. After all, there are no such things as demons or ghosts if that was really what they were. I mean, come on. Who believes in that crap anyways? <laughs> she did. The girl's eyes slowly drifted to the right again, and she suddenly stiffened. It was in the mirror. That horribly thin, black face with tiny red eyes sunk into the socket. The face floated above her right shoulder, and she leapt from the chair, banging her hip hard against the keyboard as she whirled around, ready to sprint to the door. There was nothing there. She laughed uneasily as she sat back down, nervously batting a lock of curly blonde hair from her face. Okay, she thought. Just getting a little tired, that's all. Her thigh throbbed when she sat, and she knew there would be an ugly bruise there in the morning. She sighed, slumped back on the chair, and closed her eyes for a second. When she opened them again, she felt a bolt of horror run through her. The screen had gone black, and red words had begun to scroll across it. We're waiting for... She instantly jammed the keyboard in and stood up, intent on leaving and never coming back. But as she went to the door, it suddenly slammed shut in her face. She stood for a second, unbelieving. Okay, that was weird, she said aloud, and winced as the room seemed to absorb the sound of her words. She took a deep breath and reached for the door handle savagely twisting and yanking on it when it didn't move. Is it locked? she wondered. It can't be locked. There is no lock. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw the computer screen flash, and she turned around to look at it. The words had changed from We're waiting for you to What's wrong? Don't you want to play with us? Okay, 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 the girl thought. This isn't happening. It can't be happening. She took a deep breath and sat down cautiously at the computer, staring at the words. They had changed again. So you do want to play? A small prompt blinked below the words. Shivering, she pulled out the keyboard and gently placed her hands on the keys index fingers lightly touching the small dents on the letters J and F. The room seemed to swim for a second, and she blinked rapidly until it righted itself. Steady, she thought. Steady. Swallowing hard, she typed. Play what? A couple of seconds passed, and a new line of text drifted across the screen. Hi. And seek. She wasn't scared. She was terrified. But she closed her eyes and steadied herself again. 
telling herself that none of this was real. She'd merely fallen asleep in the chair. It was all just a dream. She opened her eyes, and her hands fluttered across the keyboard. Who are you? The response was almost instant. Fifty. Half a second. Forty-nine. Half a second. Forty-eight. Her eyes widened. Forty-seven. It was counting down. Forty-six. What happened when it reached zero? Forty-five. Hide and seek? Forty-four. Suddenly it clicked. Forty-three. It wanted to play hide and seek. Forty-two. And it wanted her to play. Forty-one. Whether she wanted to or not. You should hide now, she thought. Thirty-nine. She stood up and backed away from the computer. Thirty-eight. Almost tripped over the chair. Thirty-seven. She looked wildly around the room. Thirty-six. She had to hide. Thirty-five. But what happens when it finds me? Thirty-four. Her heart beat furiously in her chest. Thirty-three. Oh, God, where should she hide? Thirty-two. Her breath quickened. Thirty-one. The closet? Thirty. No, the door had been taken off long ago. Twenty-nine. Under the bed? Maybe. But was she fit? Twenty-seven. Under the desk? Twenty-six. It would find her for sure. Twenty-five. The addition? Twenty-four. No, she couldn't go in there. Twenty-three. She just couldn't. She bent down and looked under her bed. Twenty-one. Nothing. Then she got on her stomach. Twenty. And tried to wedge herself under. Nineteen. The metal base jammed into her shoulder. Eighteen. She was too big. Seventeen. She stood up and looked around wildly, her terror, sixteen, threatening to choke her, fifteen. The addition was the only place she could go, fourteen. She couldn't just stand here, thirteen, and wait for it to find her, twelve. Oh, God help me. Please, don't make me go in there. Ten. Her fear was irrational. Nine. There was nothing in there. Eight. But her own imagination. Seven. And a pile of junk. Six. She backed towards the quilt. Five. Reached out behind her. Four. Her hand touched its rough surface. Three. She gripped it. Two. Yanked it aside. One. And stepped back. Zero. Let it fall before her eyes as she glimpsed the words on the computer. Ready or not, here I come. Before the quilt slid before her eyes, she found herself staring at it. Framed against the light, it was hard to see detail, but she saw enough. 
It was tall, its head almost touching the doorframe, its skin reflecting the light from the bedroom, almost making it glow with demonic energy. It stepped towards her, its outline shivering somehow. She stepped back, stumbled over something, and fell. She kept falling, falling through the dark. It pressed in on her from all sides, suffocating her. With a thud, she hit the floor. Dazed for a minute, she lay there, blinking away the pain. Suddenly, she realized there was no light. The quilt had fallen back into place. But there should be light around the edges of the quilt. Yet, there was nothing but the soft velvet of black all around her. She sat up and the floor creaked. She froze. Had that been her? The floor creaking as she had sat up. It came again, this time from the left of her. That hadn't been her. What if it was in here with her? What if it was just waiting for her to move and give away her position? She had to get out. Had to get out of here before it came for her. Fear fluttered in her chest again. Something moved behind her. She could feel it moving. Sliding through the dark like a hot knife through butter. It melted her fear away to free the panic waiting beneath. She scrambled to her feet and began to stumble about the room, looking for a wall, or better yet, the quilt. Strange objects jammed into her sides, and she tripped and fell, scraping her hands on something sharp. Banging her knees and elbows, she fought her way forward. How could it move so quietly through this mess? Suddenly, her hand hit something slimy, and she jerked away. Turning away from it, she stumbled forward. The need to get out became more urgent, and she hit her side on something sharp and hard, hissing in pain. She stopped and grabbed her side, feeling a wetness beginning to spread. A pair of bright, yellow eyes opened before her, and she suddenly forgot about the pain. The eyes widened, opening into deep, pits of darkness, darker even than that which surrounded her. She felt mesmerized by them, compelled to step into their darkness, to step inside them and never look back. She tried to resist it, knowing if she gave in to that impulse that she would never walk out of the room alive. She pulled away from the eyes, but it hurt to do so. It felt like claws digging into her mind, forcing her to look back. She barely turned away when she did feel claws. There on her arm, dragging her back into those terrible eyes. She felt long strips of flesh being torn away as they clung desperately to her. She sucked in a deep breath, and with one last effort, wrenched herself from their eager grasp. She squeezed her eyes shut and reached out behind her. She felt the heavy weight of the quilt beneath her fingers and tore it back excitedly, a shout of victory rising in her throat. The cry died on her lips as she stares into... The girl sat up suddenly. Sweat was dripping down her spine, yet she was as cold as ice. Was this what a chill sweat felt like? She shuddered. Oh, what was wrong with her? Her sleep-blurred vision began to clear, and the sweat froze, leaving little ice trails down her back. This wasn't her bed. This wasn't her room. She closed her eyes and let the chill sweep through her again. Oh, what had happened last night? She could barely remember a thing. She'd been sitting at the computer, working on her latest story when... <sighs> her eyes flew open. 
The computer. She was in the computer room. Dashing from the bed, she rushed over to it. It was still running, but the screen was blank. No words. Relief flowed through her. Her tense muscles relaxed, and she realized she'd been expecting something to be there. As the initial shock passed, she began to wonder. How had she ended up in the bed? Think back. Think back. What had happened last night? Her thoughts swirled around as she tried to make sense of them. The computer. It had to be something to do with the computer. She'd been trying to come up with the next chapter to her story when, suddenly, words, words had begun scrolling across the screen. Then they'd begun to count down. She had gone scared and, had she stopped, turned around, the quilt. She'd gone behind it to hide from, from something. An image suddenly comes to mind. She is standing in the dark behind the quilt. Little streams of light flicking around the edges of the blanket. Her hand pulling it back. Long, dark claws jutting from the black-fleshed fingers. The light flickers again and goes out. She is alone. Only she is not. There is something on the other side of the quilt, and it's coming to get her. She shakes her head bringing herself back from the memory, a memory she can't quite grasp. Gratefully, she lets it slide away instead. She walked over to the door, her eyes never leaving the quilt. She was sure that once she looked away, it would be there, waiting for her. She reached out for the handle, but stopped. It was locked. She knew it was. It had been locked before, and it would be locked again. She would be stuck in this room, playing cat and mouse with this monster forever. Or at least, until it finally caught her. Pulling herself together, she grabbed the handle. It was ice cold in her palm, sealing her skin to its hollow metal surface, forever trapping her within its world. Tears formed in the corner of her eyes as she twisted it, afraid it would shatter in her hand, but even more afraid it would devour her with its cold, turning her very insides to ice. <sighs> it wasn't locked. She's shaking with the relief, and somehow she finds the ability to laugh. But the laugh comes out wrong. It sounds like a madman laughing at the world, comfortable in his delusions. She pulls the door open. It is heavy in her hand. She looks out into the hallway, but the hallway isn't there. She screams. Case 6 People in gas masks are outside a building in a dead cornfield. We've been driving around Texas for a while. Clayton, Tom and I had recently graduated, so we had no destination. We were just there to dick around and create some memories until we had to snap back to real life. At one point, Tom had gotten into a heated bar fight at some dingy joint in Bexar County. The police were called. Although we hadn't gotten any charges, the cops pretty much warned us that we weren't welcome back in the area. Fair enough. We decided to tone it down a bit. That's when we started planning some shit that wouldn't get us potentially stabbed and or arrested. We all settled on the paranormal. That stuff was just so interesting, you know. I guess it preys on that esoteric fear of the unknown that the human psyche implicitly holds, stimulating some kind of fucked up rush to the brain. Anyways, 
we were in the market for some spooky shit. We looked around and did some research, but no potential destinations popped out at us immediately. They were either too far away, sounded boring, or sounded like absolute made-up horseshit. It wasn't until we found ourselves at another obscure bar near the other end of the county where something truly interesting popped up. We'd gotten shit-faced during happy hour and couldn't stop ourselves from talking to all the locals. In the midst of a conversation with a construction worker, we brought up the fact that we were looking for some paranormal thrills. He scoffed when we said this. Yeah, everyone's got their stories around here. Let me guess, you went to some shitty abandoned barn. Somebody claimed it a little ghost girl. Found nothing, and now you want something real. Not exactly, Clayton responded. We haven't gone anywhere yet. We're looking, though. The man nodded. Well, I've got something for you. As he said this, we all perked up. Now, our expectations weren't high at this point. I mean, the chances of him lying and feeding us some BS story were astronomical. However, we still listened. We were looking for anything at this point. The man continued. Don't know if this has anything to do with ghosts or demons, but it's weird enough. If you drive about 15 miles west from here, you'll find an abandoned cornfield maze. Used to be a big tourist draw, but it didn't pan out long term. The place is dead now. Creepy as shit. But here's what you'll be looking for. At the center of the maze, there's a building. I saw it with a few buddies of mine when we went exploring there a few weeks back. It's only got one floor, but I ain't sure of how far it goes. Here's the fucked up part. Apparently, that building wasn't there when the cornfield was still functioning. Nobody knows when it was built. <laughs> Weird shit, huh? We couldn't get a closer look at it because, well, because there were five people standing at the entrance, wearing these freaky-looking masks, like the ones people use in those apocalypse movies. Gas masks, I piped up. Yeah, sure. He continued. Anyways, the minute they saw us, we bolted. I mean, we weren't sticking around for that shit. He paused, taking a big swig of his beer. You guys can check it out, though. Personally, I wouldn't go back. But it's up to you, if you're looking for that kind of stuff. There's directions in there, so probably you won't get lost. I try to keep out of sight from those people, though. Who the fuck knows what they're up to? As soon as he finished his explanation, I exchanged glances with Tom and Clayton. They had the same looks on their faces that I probably did. There was no way in hell that we weren't going. Didn't even matter too much if the guy was completely lying about the building. A dead cornfield made sounded fun enough to explore. He gave us some more detailed directions before leaving. We decided to take a few hours in order to sober up before heading over there. It was only 3pm after all. At around 6, we started driving. The sun was still high and probably not coming down anytime soon, so we had no fear of getting lost in the maze. A little while later, we found the place. The crops were taller than we'd expected, but they were indeed dead. There seemed to be a small lot to the side, so we parked there. Funny enough, it was empty, save for us. Ugh, looks like we won't be seeing any spooky gas mask men, Clayton blurted out. Ugh, what a shame. Yeah, I'm sure if you were part of some weird cult located in the middle of a cornfield... You'd leave your vehicles out for everyone to see. Yeah, good thinking, Tom responded. Clayton looked as if he was about to make a comeback, but closed his mouth. I heard him mutter some expletives as he walked past me. 
as we step foot into the somewhat foreboding labyrinth. We notice what the construction worker was talking about. There was duct tape on the ground, forming the shape of arrows. Like the guy told us, we just followed them. While we traversed our way through the maze, Tom raised a concern. What if those arrows aren't actually leading us to the center? What the fuck are you talking about? I responded. Well, think about it. This is the easiest way to rob someone. That guy didn't seem a little bit sketchy to you? <laughs> what if we're being led directly to him? Where he's waiting with like six other guys or something? Yeah, I don't know, man. I told him. It sounds like paranoia to me. In retrospect, what he was saying made a lot of sense. However, that would have been a way better outcome than the one we actually got. Don't worry about it, Clayton piped up. He then lifted up his shirt to reveal a small revolver strapped to his waist. Dude, what the fuck? Tom flinched at the sight. <laughs> Gun laws in Texas, he smiled. Just in case, you know? Whatever, man. Just don't wave that shit around. Jesus Christ, Tom retorted. Although my own initial reaction was one of shock, I couldn't help but feel my nerves calm a bit, knowing that Clayton had the weapon. We followed the arrows for what felt like ten more minutes before we finally reached a clearing. To our absolute bewilderment, a building was right there in front of us. Actually, calling it a building is kind of a stretch. There was only one floor, after all. It really didn't even look too big. Maybe the size of three convenience stores mashed together in a mesh of stone. But, as creepy as it was, there was nobody in sight. Well, at first. We must have stood there and stared at the thing for five minutes before the door swung open. In that instant, we all retracted back into the maze. Fortunately, there was a small hole in the stalks where we could peek out from. It was small, so we went one at a time. Being deathly quiet, I strained my vision, eventually managing to make out four figures standing right by the entrance. Funnily enough, they did indeed have gas masks on, but other than that, they seemed to be wearing casual clothing. I looked at Tom and Clayton, trying to get a read on how they were feeling about this. They just shrugged. I guess that we all made some kind of silent agreement not to leave, because none of us budged. I don't know why we didn't. Looking back on it, there were a multitude of things that were obviously wrong with the situation that we'd put ourselves in. However, well, I suppose that adrenaline makes you do a lot of crazy shit. We must have waited in the maze for about an hour before the gas mask people left. They didn't go inside, however. They went around to the sides of the building and disappeared from view. We waited for about ten more minutes, but nobody came back. Let's go, Clayton whispered. Are you kidding? Tom barked back. So you're telling me that we waited here for nothing? Don't be a pussy. This is fucking crazy. A few more moments of silence passed while Tom and I contemplated this. Oh, fuck it, he finally spoke up. Clayton gestured to his waist. If anything goes wrong, right? If anything goes wrong, we're calling the damn cops, I told him. I wasn't exactly excited at the prospect of a shootout. Moving quickly and quietly, we made our way to the front door. I couldn't locate a knob anywhere, so I tried pushing. At first, I just thought it wasn't supposed to open that way, but then I realized it was just really heavy. It took a few tries, but I finally managed to get through. The three of us stepped into what appeared to be a living room. There were no windows, 
but a light bulb dangling from the ceiling gave us all the illumination we needed. All in all, there was a couch, a table with a few chairs, and some stools. We walked around, but couldn't find anything worth mentioning. However, we started hearing footsteps coming from outside a few moments later. Although we should have been expecting this, our faces still went pale. Shit, I heard Tom mutter under his breath. I scanned the room and located another door near the far corner. It was pretty obvious what choices we had here. We snuck our way over to it and barged in. Thankfully, this one wasn't heavy as shit. We were suddenly plunged into pitch black as we heard the front entrance open. We all collectively turned on our cell phone flashlights in order to see where the hell we were. I nearly dropped my phone as the light struck our surroundings. We were in a tunnel. In fact, it nearly resembled the catacombs, but without skulls. The walls and ceiling were rough and uneven, and the whole place just gave off a get-the-fuck-out-of-there vibe. It was long as well. No clear end in sight. We didn't move. Clearly, none of us really wanted to go further. However, what we heard from the entrance room made us reconsider. It sounded like somebody was dragging a large crate out there. We could make out voices, but they were too muffled to understand. I nearly shouted out in surprise when an abrupt, heavy stomping echoed in from under the door. It sounded like an elephant was moving around out there. It was immediately followed by a deep, grating voice that was nowhere near human. It was laughing, but without emotion, if you can imagine that. We took off once we heard the stomping coming towards us. There was no way out here. We ran quietly, using the walls and shaky phone lights in order to navigate. Eventually, we found a ladder climbing upwards just as we heard the door to the tunnel swing open. We must have climbed for about five minutes. We were all exhausted when we finally made it up. However, it was still pitch fucking black. We shone our lights around, but this time we couldn't see anything. It was as if we were in a large cave or something. At some point, we managed to locate a wall and used it to guide us along. But then again, we had no idea where we were going. About five minutes later, Tom stopped. Guys, where the fuck are we? I had no idea why he'd chosen to ask this now. How are we supposed to know? I responded. I shone my light on his face, revealing a demeanor that was equal parts confused and terrified. He shook his head. When we were looking at it from the outside, this place didn't have a second floor. That's when it hit me. I guess there had been too much adrenaline pumping through my veins. I hadn't even noticed it up until that point. We'd been climbing up that ladder for a while. We hadn't gone down any stairs, but there was also no second floor. So... Where the fuck were we? My attempts to rationalize this were cut short as a light flicked on some meters away from us. We all snapped our heads toward that direction. The area that had actually been illuminated was rather small. It was maybe about the size of a bedroom. However, standing right under that light was a person. The person wearing a gas mask. But unlike the people that had been standing outside, this person, or thing, or whatever, was also wearing a full hazmat suit. We watched in abject horror as it started walking towards us. As soon as it left the light, we heard it start running. 
Wasting no time, we started booking it. The only direction that we had was away from the thing chasing us. As we ran, more and more lights started coming on, and under each newly illuminated space was another figure in a gas mask and hazmat suit. At one point, there had to have been twelve sets of footsteps coming at us from all directions. Out of sheer luck, I managed to spot a metal door in the wall up ahead. I pushed my legs, which were about to buckle at that point, and made a surge towards it. I tried shouting out for the others, but only Clayton was in sight. We made brief eye contact before he and I managed to reach and close the door behind us. There didn't seem to be a lock, so we just pushed our body weight against it, hoping to hell that that would be enough to keep those things out. Eventually, we felt someone pushing back. There was no way in hell that we were letting up. Not even when we heard Tom's voice coming from the other side. Guys, what the fuck are you doing? Let me in. We didn't budge. That was not Tom. There was something about his tone. His cadence that made it pretty obvious. He was speaking in broken patterns, like a text-to-speech translator. Oh God, I can see them coming after me. They're getting close. Guys, guys, guys. His voice had been getting deeper and deeper ever since he started talking. It had pretty much turned into a guttural growl at that point. Eventually, whatever was on the other side stopped speaking English altogether replacing it with some kind of language that I'm pretty sure wasn't meant for the human ear. It was making noises that made my brain feel like it was about to implode. Eventually, it got to be too much, and I had to cover my ears. It was at that moment when the door swung open and the thing stepped in. My phone had fallen onto the ground, facing upwards, so I could see the illumination the horrific figure slowly making its way towards me. When it was mere centimeters away, I heard the gunshots. Clayton had fired all six rounds into the back of this thing. I watched as the creature jerked around violently before slumping to the floor. I got up, trying to regain my bearings. Clayton's breaths were heavy and scattered, as he bent down towards the thing. What the hell are you doing? I asked him. I just need to know, was all that he said back. It looked as if he were trying to rip the mask off of whatever was wearing it, but instantly winced upon touching it. It's slippery. What the hell? I bent down myself to get a better look. This is when I nearly burst into hysterics. What I had initially thought to be the rubber of the mask seemed to be something else entirely. It was squirming, like black intestines. Clayton cursed again before taking the revolver and smashing the eye holes. But instead of shattering glass, we were met with the sight and sound of something bursting open. Some kind of black goo had gotten all over both the weapon and Clayton's hand. He shrieked in pain as he flung the revolver away. A few seconds later, I noticed movement on the ground. There were things pouring out of the burst eye hole. They looked to be some kind of dark insect with a multitude of legs. We didn't waste any more time. We started running. I can't say how long for. All I know is that once we started, we couldn't stop. Still trapped in the ever-engulfing darkness of whatever hellhole we had stumbled upon, the cell phone flashlights were our only hope of navigation. We made our way through what appeared to be a twisted maze of halls. At nearly every turn we took, there seemed to be more and more of those masked creatures wandering around. Whenever we saw one of them, we just took another route. 
Sometime later, we found steps leading downwards. At that point, it seemed like the best option. Before we descended, Clayton held out his arm and leaned against the wall, trying to catch his breath. That's when I noticed his hand. It looked as if he were wearing a rubber glove. I told him, and he just stared at it in dismal confusion. What the fuck? he exclaimed, before trying to take it off. However, it wouldn't move. He started freaking out, forcefully pulling on his fingers. I moved the light close up to it. Oh god, I really wish I hadn't. He wasn't wearing a glove. No, his hand had become one. Well, partially anyways. The amalgamation of skin and rubber was absolutely revolting to look at. However, we didn't have time to deal with this. There were footsteps coming towards us. Without any more hesitation, we rushed down the steps. After about five minutes of this, we noticed a light in the distance. Now, this would have been great news, except for the fact that it was purple. Sure wasn't sunlight. We started moving closer, not wanting to rush into whatever was emitting the creepy glow. Eventually, we found ourselves in a room at the bottom of the steps. There were obscure, alien-looking symbols crawled all across the walls and floors, in addition to four buckets filled with dark liquid sitting in each corner. There was also one door on the other side. But the real story was at the center. Right in the middle of the room was what I can only describe as a purple void. A hole in the concrete that was devoid of time and space. A path to oblivion. I don't know how long I stared at the thing. All that I know is that I snapped out of my trance once a figure started emerging from it. It was another one of those gas mask creatures. The entity made a sickening shriek as it crawled its way out of an unknown reality and into ours. I turned around to see Clayton kneeling down in a corner. He was whimpering. I took a few steps toward him before he spun around to look at me. His face, it had changed. Half of it was still the same Clayton that I'd always known, but the other half, he was turning into one of them. The next few moments were a blur. I remember making a beeline towards the door and rushing through it. It led to another tunnel, and I had nowhere to go but forwards. After an ungodly amount of running, I was met with another door at the end. I pushed it open to find myself back in the first room of the building. I looked around, but nobody seemed to be there. I bolted out into the night. It was a bit disorienting trying to find my way back through the maze, but I eventually did. Thankfully, I hadn't let go of the car keys at any point, so I was able to drive out of there. I called the police immediately and pointed them towards the direction of the cornfield maze. I told them that we'd stumbled upon the building when we were jumped and that only I had gotten away. There was no way in hell that they'd believe the truth. They said that they go check it out, but I never did hear back from them. In fact, every time I called asking for an update, the operator acted like it was the first time I'd spoken to them. I just gave up after that. Not knowing what to do, I just made my way to another bar. I knew that drinking this kind of experience away probably wasn't possible, but I was going to give it a shot anyways. But, guess what? Sitting down in the first bar that I went to was the same construction worker who had initially told us about the cornfield. Note that this was a different bar than the one we'd met him in. He was talking to what appeared to be a young couple. When we made eye contact, he didn't smile, wave, or gesture me over. 
He just glared at me with a stunned expression on his face. Well, my dear friends, that was a bit of a left-field subject to uh, be touching on tonight, but one that really terrifies me. It's what I define as the absolute key to horror. Everything which is just totally normal to you, but suddenly it's a little bit off-key. Something's changed and um, your whole world is um, turned into something completely different. So yeah, the idea of liminal spaces, those things that we occupy every day, but no one lives there, no one occupies it on a permanent basis. When you remove the human element, suddenly it becomes terrifying. Well, to me at least. <laughs> Hope you agree and that you enjoyed that selection of stories tonight. A couple I'd done there before, but uh, I wasn't happy with the original, so I re-recorded them for this compilation. Well, that is enough for this evening, my dear friends. Back again very soon. Maybe even tomorrow night. Who knows? Yeah, try and get something out for tomorrow night as well. I've been neglecting you all recently, and you deserve a little bit more. Well, till the next time, my dear friends. Very, very sweet dreams, and bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me, and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram... You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.